my name is Basha. I'm a bioinformatician and I work in the Magnify service team. I'm joined by my colleague today as well, Jamana, who I think wanted to say a quick hello, if she can. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, as Varsha told, my name is Romana. I also work as a bioinformatician uh, and I will take a look at the chat and uh, try to answer your quick questions if you have any during the webinar. Otherwise, I guess Varsha will answer to them at the end of her presentation. Perfect, thanks. So this is an overview of what we'll cover today. So we'll talk about the Magnify service as a whole, the different data types that we analyze, briefly how the data flow looks like in Magnify. So this is both the raw data that goes into Magnify when you request an analysis and also the output of the respective analysis pipelines. I'll also cover the newest version five of our analysis pipeline and go through how those changes look on the website. So I'll try and give you a live demo of the website as well. So what is Magnify? Just in case um, you haven't used Magnify before, it's a service for assembly, analysis and archiving of microbiome data. And what we provide are automated pipelines for analysis and ar archiving of public and pre-publication private, pre-publication or private microbiome data. And these pipelines contain a series of taxonomic and functional um, annotations for environmental samples. So this is what the Magnify homepage looks like, and I'll take you through the page a little bit later. But um, these are the data types that we analyze. So you can request analysis of a public or private data, which is pre-publication. Um, and if you give us consent to access that data, then we can analyze that for you. We analyze um, meta barcoding or Amplicon data sets. So this can be 16S, for example. Metagenomic shotgun reads, uh, metatranscriptomic reads, and also assemblies. So if you send us some raw reads, uh, we can also assemble that for you and then analyze the subsequent assembly. We then do the annotation with the, annota the analysis pipelines, which I'll explain in a bit more detail. And then what you get back is the ability to browse these analysis in the, in the Magnify website. And you can also download um, analysis files as well. We have two other features, uh, one which allows you to perform a sequence search against a non-redundant uh, protein database. And the other is our genomes tab here, which um, is again a non-redundant uh, isolate and metagenome assemble genome resource for the human gut. So that's quite a recent addition and I won't talk about these two points much more in this webinar as they uh, probably would be better if it was talked about in the, their own webinar in a little bit more detail. But please feel free to play with those two tabs as well when you visit the website. Within Magnify, we have samples from many environments and we've seen the biomes become more diverse over time. So what you can see um, here is just a list of some of the biomes that we have in Magnify. And this is just very few of them, just to show you what the biomes look like. And if you look at the two charts, you can see the biomes and how they've changed from May 2019 to November 2020, so the most recent. And what's interesting is that we're seeing more diversity in biomes moving away from just human data. So we're looking at things like uh, food production and terrestrial, which is soil and grasslands, uh, wastewater. And then also notably, you have this entire section of other data sets, which contains things like birds, other mammals, bioreactor, insects, other en engineered environments. So there's a lot of different data sets in um, Magnify. So this is how the Magnify data flow works. And where we start is with uh, you as the user who takes the sample and uh, does the sequencing in the lab or sends it for sequencing. And then what you can do is request analysis of Magnify. But there is also this middle uh, man, which is ENA. 
The European Nucleotide Archive is where all raw data needs to be deposited first before we then inherit it and magnify and um, analyze it. So European Nucleotide Archive has uh, its own set of metadata. So um, we inherit all of that metadata. So it's quite important that that's done first. After it's been archived in ENA, we can then pick it up and perform the analysis of the raw reads for you. Or if you want to request an assembly of the raw reads, we can do that too and then perform the analysis. And then what you end up with is a set of figures, some of which are interactive, and also a set of download files. So there have been six different analysis pipelines so far, and the most current one is version five. And we know these pipelines quite well. We're aware of the database versions and the tool versions that we use in each. And what having this pipeline uh, aspect allows us to do is uh, allows you to do is compare uh, analyses across studies for one pipeline. So this is what the magnified data structure looks like. And as I mentioned, we do inherit a lot of this from uh, ENA. And then we inherit it from ENA and we have it in Magnify. And the first portion of this hierarchy is the super study. There aren't many super studies in Magnify and these are super studies are very, very big projects that contain multiple studies. The next step is the study. The study is the project which contains all the other aspects. So the samples, the runs, the assemblies, and the analysis. And the study will be the basic description of the project. We then move to the sample. The sample will contain the metadata of the sample that you've extracted. So this can be anything ranging from extraction method to storage to sample type taxonomy. So um, ENA holds a set of checklists um, and each checklist has slightly different metadata. And then connected to each sample, you would have a run. So this is your sequence data, or if you ask for us to assemble it for you, you also have an assembly that we upload to ENA that's then linked back to your original sample. And we then perform analyses on all of the runs and assemblies. And where you can see two arrows coming out of a run or assembly, that's where we've done the analysis with more than one pipeline. And I just wanted to mention how important it is to have accurate metadata. Because we inherit the metadata from ENA, it helps us populate certain things such as the biome. So we predict the biome based on the metadata that you give us. And it will be more accurate if the metadata that's inputted into ENA is very accurate. And this also helps with um, other users who want to then pull down public data sets and compare. The more metadata there is, the more useful that kind of comparison becomes. So we've talked so far about the breadth of data in Magnify. So as you can imagine, analyzing this data comes with its own set of challenges. Take one data type, for example, metagenomic data. So this is sequencing of all the genetic material in an environment. And when you do this, you immediately lose the luxury of having a known reference genome. And we're dealing with mostly unknowns. As a result, most sequences can be missing from existing reference databases. And this is both taxonomic and functional um, database, functional annotation databases. If you're working with a well-characterized data set, such as the human gut, this might uh, yield good results. But as we've seen with mesh genomic data sets, there are still many unknowns to be found, even in well-characterized environments. Another fallback when dealing with short read shotgun data is that you're working with very short fragments that don't always cover whole genes or don't assemble into complete genes, which makes them harder to ca characterize. Additionally, a lot of these processes can be computationally expensive and part and parcel of this is the complexity of the data set. For example, a high diversity data set such as soil would be more computationally expensive to assemble and analyze than a lower diversity data set. 
Now, if I jump to just the last point on this slide, there are a plethora of analysis tools available, which are being constantly upgraded as the field progresses. And new genomes and annotations are being deposited into public archives. So they each use different analysis tools and different algorithms and thresholds, which in turn can result in slightly different analysis outputs. So when we take all of these points into consideration for Magnify, what we need to offer is a standardized workflow, which is meaningful for all data types and biomes that we receive. So our tools and pipelines are selected to give you as the users as much information as possible about what's in your data set with some of the most widely used databases. And I'll go through the tools and annotations that we use now. So I'm gonna start by talking about just the previous version, so version 4.1. And the reason for this is that the beginning of the workflow has, workflow has remained largely the same with the exception of updated tools and updated databases. So when you submit your data into Magnify, uh, the first thing we'll do is perform quality control. So this might be removing uh, short reads or long strings of ambiguous bases. And then taking those uh, quality controlled reads, we use RFAM models to extract the uh, large subunit and small subunit ribosomal RNA. And we map those to the silver database to give you taxonomic annotations. Additionally, with the raw reads, we perform protein predictions. So um, uh, using prodigal and frag gene scan. And then we use Interpro to characterize these. So Interpro is a resource of combined predictive models or signatures, some of which um, are calculated using profile hidden Markov models. And they're taken from many member databases and put into a single searchable resource. We use five of those member databases uh, within Magnify because they um, largely cover all the biological entities within Interpro. And the output that you get are any matches to signatures. And additionally, another output are any gene ontology terms. So these are the Go terms you see here. Gene ontology terms are terms that are used to assign a functional description to the genes, and they're essentially a controlled vocabulary for describing the roles of the genes and gene products. Gene ontology is massive, and this becomes quite difficult for visualization. So uh, Go slims were generated internally using 20 billion predicted uh, coding sequences from mesh genomic data, and the annotations were grouped into a subset of terms. So for example, the Go slim metal iron binding is an umbrella term for the go terms calcium iron binding lead iron binding and so on so that's where we've started we've qc'd the reads uh, we've extracted the large and small subunit ribosome or rna uh, we've predicted proteins run them through interpro and looked at the gene ontology terms so sorry that's quite a lot already but what Magnify Analysis version 5 does is it builds on this. So this version of the pipeline introduced, introduces more tools and databases to aid with analysis at different stages in the pipeline. We have three standardized pipelines for three data types. So uh, Amplicon data sets, raw shotgun data and assemblies. And the pipelines are described in common workflow language and run using the TOIL workflow engine. So I'll start with the Amplicon pipeline. So in addition to this small uh, subunit and large subunit rhymes over RNA, we've also introduced an uh, annotation of the internal transcribed spacer or ITS. These regions are being used increasingly to classify uh, eukaryotic in particular fungal organisms. The ITS regions one and two fall between the small and large uh, rRNA and 5.S rRNA. And there are many different primers that are used to sequence these amplicons. As you can see, some of these primers also overlap the large and small subunit region. So what we do is we take the predictions from LSU and SSU and mask them in the original data set and use this as an input for ITS. And the databases we map against are ITS1, which uh, contains ITS1, 
sequences and UNITE, which has both ITS1 and 2 regions. And that's where our Amplicon pipeline ends. So if I move on to the Broread pipeline now, uh, you'll remember from the uh, original slide that we did the protein prediction here, the interprost scan um, annotation and the gene ontology annotation. So what we've added here is that we also include now PFAM annotations. PFAM is one of the member databases of Interpro and the annotations are passed from the Interpro results. So it is a bit redundant, but the reason that we do this is because PFAM is used very widely and covers a lot of the protein space. So we wanted to provide these as a separate annotation and visualization. And what PFAMs are, are protein families and domains assigned using uh, profile HMMs. The next addition was uh, the use of KEG. So KEG is a collection of databases dealing with these protein predictions that we make, but in the context of the whole biological system. For example, uh, metabolic pathways and uh, molecular networks, and it uses these predicted proteins as building blocks. We use two particular categories of KEG, so KEG orthologs and KEG modules. The KEG orthology database is used to assign high level grouping of functional annotation. And these again are annotations based on a HMM database of KEG orthologs, which are generated from curated KEG uh, genes and protein families. And the last thing that we've added to the raw read pipeline is mo to use Meta use assigns taxonomy to the raw reads, and it does this using a universal and single copy marker genes to delineate prokaryotic organisms at species level. So the Meta use database is made up of uh, prokaryotic reference genomes and publicly available metagenomes as well, and they're clustered um, by marker gene based operational taxonomic units, and we provide these as a downloadable file. So moving on to the assembly pipeline now. This is an extension of the raw reads pipeline and you can see that I've highlighted that, um, so PFAM annotation already and the KEG annotation here, we don't provide mode to use for assembly. Uh, what we can do with assemblies is because we have more contiguous sequences, potentially more complete genes. And in theory, each contig um, refers to one genome or one species. So it allows us to make pathway level annotations as well. So after we get the KEG ortholog annotations, we then perform a pathway annotation by looking at KEG modules. So we take the KEG ortholog annotations and assign modules depending on the orthology present. And what KEG modules are, are functional units of gene sets which can be linked to metabolic pathways. And they're presented like this, where you have several paths to complete the pathway. Our KEG pathway annotation is an internal script and it looks at every possible network to complete that pathway and estimates the pathway completeness based on the KEG ortholog presence. The next thing I'll talk about is anti-smash and this is performed on the uh, quality controlled contigs. It allows for identification, annotation, and analysis of biosynthetic gene clusters in bacterial and fungal genomes. And these code for secondary metabolites, so they might be useful for um, identifying certain clusters which have a competitive advantage. And these are um, visualized as a bar graph that I will show you later. We can see the top three, uh, top 10 hits. So. The next thing we look at is genome properties. So what we've done here is we've taken KEG annotations and looked at pathways from KEG annotations. Now we can take the interpro scan annotations and look at what pathways we can generate there. So genome properties assigns a high level function um, attribute to genomes based on the presence of a defined set of protein signatures. So the properties which often describe pathways are composed of steps and each step uh, defines a protein required for the function of that pathway. So genome properties uses the protein signatures as an evidence to determine the presence of each step within a property. 
Users can browse the genome properties, which are arranged within a hierarchy, examining the specific steps um, defined, and then you can link out to the genome properties website as well. So the final for the uh, functional side of things is Egnol. And what Egnol Mapper is, it's a tool for a fast functional annotation of novel sequences. And it uses a big database of pre-computed orthologs and groups um, to do this. And it outputs many different functional annotations of which one is the COG, so the clusters of orthologous groups. And using Eggnog and all the previous functional annotations that we've described, what we can then generate is this contig browser that allows you to look at each contig and the features within that contig. So I will demonstrate that as well. And then finally, for the assembly pipeline, we also provide a diamond taxonomic classification. Uh, diamond is a classifier that works by finding uh, homologs in your protein sequences. And the reference database that we use is UniREF uh, 90. And this is a set of reference clusters that are clustered at 90% sequence identity threshold. So what I'll do now is switch over to the website and give you a run through of how to navigate the website and what it looks like. And hopefully that will answer some questions as well. So this is what the Magnify homepage looks like. And first things first, how to submit a request. So you can submit a request for a public data set by clicking request here or a private pre-publication data set. And when you click this, what this will do is um, allow you to log in. We need you to give a webinar account for um, every time you request so we can associate it with a webinar account. And um, your webinar ID would go here and your password. What you currently see on the site, all of the studies and all of the analyses are public. If you have any pre-publication data that you've submitted, you can log in here. And again, that's the same thing. It will ask you for your webinar account and that's how you access the data. There are several tabs at the top that you can use for navigating the website. I mentioned the sequence search and the genomes feature, which I won't talk too much about. I also want to draw you to the API feature, which will allow you to um, download data sets. And there is an upcoming webinar on that from my colleague, Martin, who will go through how to do that. So please look out for that. You can browse data in several ways. You can browse by data type, so by the type of data, or you can browse by the data flow, so studies, samples, analyses, or you can actually browse by the biome itself. So say I were to browse by soil, I've just opened this in a new tab, but this is the page that you would get. It shows you a list of all the studies related to soil environments. And if you want to drill down even further based on your study, you can look for the type of soil. So if you're looking at a study that's only looking at grasslands, you can filter that way. You can also browse the data this way. Um, and these are the super studies that I mentioned, so some of the big projects. You can look at studies by their last updated, and you can filter again by biomes, and same for samples and also publications. So we'll take you back to the main site now. And if we go to text search, you'll notice that you can again drill down by study samples analysis, but you can also filter by a wide variety of things. So for example, in the analysis tab, you can filter by um, temperature, depth, by only a certain organism, by a biome, pipeline version, experiment type, and even some of the functional annotations. So let's say that we want to look at the latest pipeline. We want to have a look at only assembly data sets. Um, I only want to, I'm only interested in skin because that's what the project I'm looking at is. And let's drill down even further into, say, only those that contain actinobacteria. That gives you a list of the analyses. So I've just picked at random this one analysis here, and I've opened the study rather than the analysis succession. And this is what the study looks like. So this is the information that we inherit from ENA. And you can see external links to ENA as well. And these are all of your analyses with the original ENA uh, sample. 
So if I click on the sample, then you can see what I talked about with the metadata. So you can see external links to ENA and the snippet of metadata that we take from ENA. So the quality of this will depend on the quality of the metadata that you supply. Now let's take a look at just the analysis. And just to show you how to do that, you can click on the analysis accession on the study page and that will take you there. This is an overview of the analysis and uh, what type of experiment it is and any other external links. The quality control tab will open um, several bar graphs. So this will tell you what it, the number pre and post trimming. So the reason this is the same is because when we perform assemblies internally, we already run quality control before we upload. So um, uh, this is why this is the same. But if you were to look at raw reads, for example, you'd, you'd probably see fewer reads post trimming. And then there are also other graphs detailing your QC. Something like nucleotide distribution should be fairly even for assembly. Moving on to taxonomic analysis, that's what this looks like. And um, this is a small subunit ribosome RNA and the corona chart's interactive. So you can drill into just a particular phylum to see how many of the reads that, ma that matches. You can also look at the phylum composition as a pie chart or as a bubble. If this was Amplicon, there would also be a separate ITS box here as well for you to navigate. So I will let the functional analysis tab load. So this is the first thing you see. You'll see the number of contigs with predicted coding sequences and those that have matches. This is the Interpro tab, so you will show you the top hits for Interpro, and as expected with mesh data, a lot of it is still unknown. And these links also take you out to Interpro. These are the gene ontology terms that we spoke about, so they're split into three categories, and if you hover over each of the processes, you can see how many annotations there are per process, or again, you can visualize this as a pie chart. These are the PFAM annotations taken from Interpro. We show you the top 10 PFAM entries and you can hover over to see what they are. And we also provide you with a full table of the class, the description and the count, and you can download these results. And the KEG author log bar graph looks very similar. So you can see, again, the top 10, the class, the description and the count. Moving on to pathways, uh, these are the KEG modules, so taken from calculated using the KEG author logs. We again show you this in a bar graph, you can see more this time, and this looks a little bit different. So this is the KEG module, the name of the module, and then the pathway, um, the hierarchy that that module is in, and then the number of missing and matching KEG author logs, and the percentage completeness as well. Genome properties, I showed you a snippet of, but what you can do is drill down into the, the hierarchy again um, until you get to one genome property and take, that will take you out to the genome property website. Anti-SMASH looks very similar to some of the bar graphs you've seen before. So you get the top 10 anti-SMASH gene clusters and again, a, a table with the descriptions. And then finally, the contig viewer. So this is the contig viewer that I mentioned, and you can filter by each of the annotation categories. What you have are the names of the contigs, the length and the coverage, and the annotations that they have. So for example, if I only want to look at contigs that have bisynthetic gene clusters, I can filter just anti-smash contigs, select this one contig, and I can scroll in and look at the uh, features. So if I click on a particular feature, it will tell me that it's a coding sequence, a predicted coding sequence, the start and end position, the protein length, and um, then all of the functional annotations. And then finally is the download page. So this contains everything that we've talked about, the process context, uh, predicted coding sequences, both amino acid and nucleotide, all of the functional annotations, including the diamond taxonomy, uh, the anti-SMASH pathway annotations, uh, taxonomic annotations as several different formats, 
and then any other non-coding uh, RNA that we find with the models that we're using. So that's um, everything that I wanted to talk to you about today. And just to summarize, Magnify is a free resource for assembly analysis and archiving of microbiome data. You can request analysis of public and private data with a pipeline version five now. And the data is analyzed using standardized analysis pipelines, uh, both for taxonomy and protein level functional annotation and for assemblies systems level annotations. And what we give you are interactive visualizations and comprehensive downloads as well. There are other tools available that I didn't go through today, but please do visit the website because this was a whistle stop tour and play around and let us know if you have any questions. And this is the documentation here. So just finally, I want to say thank you to everyone on my team. So Rob Finn is our team leader. Um, everybody else is also part of the service team and helps run Magnify service. Our colleagues at the European Nucleotide Archive, Guy and Josie, who help us a lot with submissions. And thank you very much for listening. I will try and answer any questions that you have now. Thank you very much, Rosha, for the webinar today. And mm -hmm. thank you all uh, for listening. And thank you for keeping the whole uh, atmosphere pretty dynamic. We have several questions in the chat box. Okay, great. Uh, many of them have. I mean, several of them have been already answered by uh, Jamana. So I will probably start with a few questions which haven't been answered yet. Uh, mm -hmm. But before that, Vasha, could you go to the next slide or the last slide? Yeah. Oh, I think, okay. So I think I put that at the top. So let me go back through. Fine. Oh. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you. So, so this is just to uh, let you know that uh, please visit our uh, webinar pages to find uh, more interesting webinars that you might find useful. Uh, and just to let you know that next week there is another webinar from uh, Magnify where um, uh, they will be talking about how you can access computationally uh, microbiome data. And uh, then as I told you earlier that uh, as you finish the session today, uh, there will be a, a feedback survey which will pop up. So please provide your thoughts um, and your feedback with us. They always help us to keep on uh, improving. And now we'll move on to uh, Q&A session. So first, there's a question from... May I may I do a simple comment? Sorry to interrupt you. I wanted to, to ask you if you're going uh, to follow questions from the beginning to the ending, I am in the meantime answering to the one at the bottom so that uh, we don't get confused with each other. You're okay with this? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm starting from, from the beginning. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so the first question uh, I would say which hasn't been answered yet is from, from Tin. Just a second, yeah. So what is the difference between uh, magnify and QIIME2. Chime, yeah. So we uh, we used to use Chime in uh, previous versions of Magnify, and the reason that we don't we we now use MapSeq, so we don't use Chime anymore. We use MapSeq to uh, do our taxonomic classification, and the reason we do this is we want to give you more of a, a closed reference approach. So this allows you to compare taxonomy across not only your data set, but across different studies um, just by mapping to a reference database. So if we were to use Chime to, for example, produce de novo OTUs, this becomes problematic if you want to then compare two studies because you have to take both studies and recluster the entire data set. Um, so that's that's why we uh, we don't use Chime anymore. We provide Taxonomy with Mapsi. Great. Uh, next question is from Pablo. Yeah. Is the assembly module meant for uh, MGAs or for individual assembly that is only one genome? So, all of our pipelines are designed for environmental metagenomic data sets. So, um, yeah, they're designed for uh, metagenomic data sets, not um, single genome data sets. 
Next is from uh, Marius. Is it possible by any chance to install the Magnify workflow in a Conda environment? Okay, um, so because it's CWR, what we've done, and if Jamal is our asker to just post the GitHub repo, we have a GitHub repository of all the CWR description. And um, you can peruse that repository and uh, have a look at the different parameters we use. The only thing I'd say for installation is that the assembly pipeline, for example, is hundreds of steps long and you would require significant compute to be running that locally. So if you're happy to submit to us and for us to do the analysis, we're happy to do that for you. But otherwise, there is a CWL GitHub repository and we're actively working on developing Docker containers as well so that um, those tools don't have to be installed locally. All right. Question from Sandeep. Is it possible to get all the species name in the taxonomic analysis? Mm -hmm. So if they're classified to a species level, then yes. What we provide you with is an OT, it, we call it an OTU output file, but it's a TSV with the full taxonomic lineage and the number of counts uh, in that lineage. We also provide you with the MapSeq output file. Um, and yeah, and you can take the species name from there. Not all of them will be classified confidently to a species level. So some of them will only be classified to family or for example, genus, and there'll be unknown species, but you can uh, take what you need from that part. All right, a uh, question from Prabhat. Mm -hmm. Can we do comparative metagenomic study using available data? Yeah, definitely. So um, you can both download the data and a lot of that, how to do that will be described in the API tutorial as well. We don't perform comparative analysis for you, but um, we provide you with all the output files to do so in several different formats. So they can be taken into other tools such as Megan for taxonomy, for example, um, and you can take the respective TSV JSON files into R or into a package of your choice to do comparative metronomics analysis, but we don't um, perform that in Magnify. Okay, next question from Cecilia about uh, privacy matters. Mm -hmm. Is, um, how does Magnify handles private data sets? Are those kept private till publication or released after a certain period? Okay, so we mimic the date that's in ENA. So when you submit to ENA, uh, you'll be asked to provide a release date and that can also be extended. So uh, we inherit that date from ENA. And then if you then extend that date in ENA, we also inherit that. So when your data goes public in ENA, it will go public in Magnify as well. Okay, that's great. So that was also answered by Germana as well in the chat box. Uh, next is from uh, Daniel. Uh, is it possible to build images in Magnify? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we do. We don't offer that service yet, but we do. If you have a look at the genomes tab, that is already a massive uh, human gut catalog, some of which are mags. Um, and I'd advise you to also just have a look at that publication as well. Um, we do have a general pipeline for mags internally and we're working on um, making that more accessible and putting more mags into magnify so it's not a service at the moment but it's something that we are working on to have more than just a gut catalog catalogs for different biomes for example so one question just came in from hans mm -hmm. will the mag pipeline support multi-sample coabundance in contrast to the human mag dataset database. Um, okay, so if I understand this question right, uh, are you maybe asking about uh, co-assembly and generating mags that way? So co-assembly is a is another thing that we do internally for some of the research projects. Um, it's something we're investigating and whether it yields good results and how to differentiate between um real mags and maybe chimeric mags and things like that so um again it's not something that we offer at the moment but we do do uh, co-assembly but i think the first stop for anything new with 
the genomes catalog will probably be a single sample or single run mags based on some of the contexts that we generate with public data sets. We have a time related question. So how much time uh, does the analysis take for one metagenome, a matter of weeks or months? It's, uh, it's a very difficult thing to answer. We do try and get most of the analysis done for you within two weeks, I'd say, but it also again depends on the complexity of data set and the number of runs that you have in a data set. So if you're looking upward of a thousand runs, I would say that it will probably take a little bit longer just um, because priority wise, we can't saturate um, the system with uh, that many runs in one go. But if we think it will take longer than normal, we will usually let you know. That's for analysis. If we need to assemble the data set, that might take, I would probably say at least another week, maybe more because uh, again, it depends entirely on the complexity of data set. Human gut will use something like 75 gigabytes and be done very quickly. Whereas a soil sample might take days and require more memory. So we will keep you up to date during the process though. That's brilliant. Uh, thanks a lot, Vasha, again uh, for today's webinar. And thank I'd you. like to thank Jermana for, for, for the support and answering questions in the chat box. And thank you all, all the attendees for listening to the webinar today.